some uh, very exciting recent developments within the past year and a half, basically, using um, link homology theories, Kavanaugh homology, Knopfler homology, various other tools to study this, um, uh, this concept of, of ribbon concordance, which is something that people have been studying for some time, but was sort of dormant until about um, a year and three months ago or so when Ian Zemke wrote a paper that really just sparked a tremendous amount of, um, of research in this area. Um, and um, so I'm gonna mostly be surveying the, uh, you know, sort of what's been done both in the past and then within the, all the exciting developments within the past, um, the past year or so, um, including my own uh, contributions. Um, so I'll say that the two, um, uh, the two uh, uh, of my own projects uh, that I've talked about, one is joint with Ian Zemke, um, and then the other is joint with my student Ankar Gudral, who just graduated, an undergraduate from Duke this year. Um, and our paper on this is uh, is is coming along, and hopefully will be hopefully will be on the archive soon. Um, uh, but then I'll but I'll also be surveying a lot of results, but contributions by by a very large number of other people. Um, so okay, let me share my screen now. Um, okay, and if I go full screen, okay, can everyone see um, uh, the slides? Just nod if they're visible. Great, okay, so um, I wanna start off by talking about concordance, which is certainly a, a subject that I spend a lot of time thinking about um, in various settings. Uh, a concordance between two knots, we're gonna imagine we have two knots in the three-sphere. Um, a concordance is an embedded annulus in the three-sphere cross an interval, um, whose boundary is the union of the two knots, one in uh, and you know S3 cross zero and the other is S3 cross one, it's a smoothly embedded annulus that's interpolating between these two knots. And I put a little minus sign in that definition to um, uh, just to indicate that you know you have to reverse the string orientation on the knot in, uh, you know, at the beginning. This sort of standard convention you use for what, it, what do you mean when you talk about a cohortism between these two things. And I should say this is supposed to be a smoothly embedded surface. Okay, so of course the knot is concordant to itself, you just take the product. Um, uh, Um, uh, this is an equivalence relation, the existence of a concordance, right? So if one knot is concordant to another uh, and the second one is concordant to a third one, then you can just glue those cylinders together and, um, uh, you know, and that's what you get. And then for the reverse, uh, you know, so K1 is concordant to K2, if you just reverse the time direction, the zero one direction, that gives you the, um, the other thing. Um, the classification of knots up to concordance is a very big question. Oh, we say that we say a knot is slice if it's concordant to the unknot, which is to equivalent to bounding a, um, uh, a smoothly embedded disk in the floorball. Um, and the question of classifying knots up to concordance, there's a, a group structure that you can put on the set of knots. It's a huge, richly rich subject studied by many, 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 many people. And it is also not what I came to study. Um, so, but I should also just say, by way of terminology, um, uh, you can define the same notion for links. And you say the two links are, com are uh, concordant, and that is to say they have to have the same number of components, and you have to be able to find simultaneous concordances between the components of one link and the components of the other, which are disjoint as they're embedded in, um, uh, in four dimensions. Okay, so you can, um, uh, it's a dis or you can think about it as a disjoint union of concordances. Okay, but again, each of those each of those components has to be an annulus. Okay, now what I'm really interested in here is what we're going to call ribbon concordance, uh, which is the um, title, half the title of the talk. Um, so, what is a ribbon concordance? I'm going to add one more condition on this uh, on an annulus. A, a specific concordance, which could be between knots or it could be between links, is going to be called a ribbon concordance if, when you project it onto the interval coordinate. You can think about that as giving you a Morse function. Well, if it's generically chosen, then it's a Morse function on the on this surface. Um, and so for a typical surface, a Morse function would have critical points maybe of index zero, one, and two. And we're gonna call this ribbon if it only has um, uh, index zero and index one critical points. Okay, uh, and we will say that L zero is ribbon concordant to L one, which will denote by this, uh, this funny sort of less than or equal to looking thing um, uh, if, or if a ribbon concordance exists. Okay, now, just to draw a little schematic of what this looks like, um, 
my my artwork is not so great, but you can see what this looks like. So you, I want to think in these pictures, the um, the time dimension or the zero one coordinate is drawn horizontally from left to right, and what I'm drawing here is somehow some kind of funky annulus, and you're supposed to picture this as living in in four space, in three space cross an interval. So the things on the ends are knotted curves. Um, uh, and the one on the left is ribbon because you see as we go from left to right, it has local mins um, and it has uh, saddle points. Can people see my mouse when I move it around on the screen? Good, okay, it has saddle points. Um, there's a local min, there's a, lo uh, there's a saddle, but it, no, it doesn't have any local maxes, okay, in, in the interior. Whereas this one that I've drawn and labeled as not ribbon uh, does have a local maximum uh, over here. Okay, now, um, Another way we can picture this, if we like, um, is think about it as a movie. This is going to be my Academy Award-winning movie, uh, 2020. Um, uh, we're starting with one knot, and as we evolve in time, various things can happen. One thing that happen, can happen is that births can happen. So I had um, two little unknots get born, okay? And then if you were moving around in time with no critical points, uh, well, basically these curves might move around by some Reitermeister moves. Um, preserving the link type. So, okay, there's a particularly horrible example of some, some right and master moves happening. Um, uh, you know, they, you know, so that, that link is still just the same, the red, the blue, and the black components are all just unlinked from each other. Um, but then saddles can happen. And when saddles happen, you get merges. Um, and of course, if you have like the same number of births and then merges, the same number of merges that basically end up with one component, then topologically what you form is an angle. Okay, so this is an example of, of a ribbon concordance from the trefoil knot to some horrible knot. Okay, now, um, let's give a little bit, of, little bit more terminology. Uh, we say that K is a ribbon knot if, if the unknot is ribbon concordant to K, so that is if you can start with the unknot and end up with K. Okay, um, this is the equivalent to bounding a slice disk in the four ball which only has zero and one, index zero and index one critical points, if you think about the radial function on the four ball. Okay, now, um, I wanna clarify a little terminology. A uh, switch, oh, oh, but even before I do that, um, let me just mention the famous slice ribbon conjecture, about which I have nothing to say, uh, uh, which is to say that every knot that is sliced um, is also a ribbon. Um, uh, so not every slice disc is necessarily a ribbon disc, but this conjecture that's been around for, a long time uh, is, is that any knot that happens to bound a slice disk, you can actually find it a ribbon disk. And I, I don't know, I feel like this is one of these conjectures that just has no business being true. But on the other hand, um, this is just one of these slide table components that, uh, that no one really knows how to recognize. Um, so Adam, we have a question from Masreya S. Oh. Uh, won't the symmetry of the equivalence relation fail? Yes. So I'm, I'm thinking that's that means in terms of the ribbon, but if you want to Yes. Clarify. Hold that thought for 30 seconds. I was, that is exactly what I was about to say. Okay. Um, so now, um, right. So ribbon concordance is very much, as the, as, as the questioner said, um, not a symmetric relation. Um, and even before I get into that, I just want to um, point out some funny, something funny that happened in the literature. Uh, Cameron Gordon is the one who introduced the notion of ribbon concordance back in the, in the um, uh, early 80s in 1981, um, and his terminology is a little bit different. He thinks that he would think of this, uh, what I've drawn as a ribbon concordance. He would still, he would call this a ribbon concordance from the knot on the right to the knot on the left. So there's some directionality here. He still uses the less than or equal than sign to mean the same thing. Um, the notation sort of changed suddenly, uh, or the convention sort of changed in Ian's empties paper and sort of ever it caught on very quickly um, and and for various reasons I kind of like the new the new terminology here because I think it lines up a little bit better with the way people talk about cohortisms in a functorial setting um, uh, which I can elaborate on at some point if you like um, but in any case you just have to watch out if you're uh, reading any papers on this uh, what do you what do people mean by from and to that might as well okay but now um, as uh, as um, was just pointed out, this relation is certainly reflexive and not as ribbon concordant to itself, if you can take, um, take just the product cylinder. 
and it's transitive. So if K0 is ribbon concordant to K1 and K1 is ribbon concordant to K2, you can glue those together and you get a ribbon concordance uh, from K0 to K2. Um, but it is definitely not a symmetric uh, equivalent situation. Um, uh, or not an equivalence ribbon. It's not symmetric. Uh, certainly not uh, in the way that it has been defined. Um, and indeed, the conjecture that those Gordon offered in uh, his original paper on this topic is that it's basically the opposite of being uh, an equivalence relation. It's actually uh, supposed to be a partial order relation. So I'll put, put, say that in uh, uh, one second. Um, uh, the conjecture says that if you have two knots and one of them is ribbon concordant to the other and the other is ribbon concordant to the one, so this, is, this necessarily has to be like two very different looking concordance, concordances. And they are necessarily the same knot. That's the um, that's the idea. That, so that is to say that this is giving me a, a well-defined partial order relation. If you think back to proofs 101, you know, part of the definition of partial order is that if two things are one's less than or equal to the other and the other is less than or equal to the one, then they must in fact be equal. Um, so this is conjectured to be some kind of order relation. Um, and the philosophy is somehow that if L0 or K0, um, and we can think about this in terms of links or in terms of knots, and Court, Gordon stated this in terms of links and in terms of knots, and certainly most of the work that's been done on this subject has been about knots, but you can really ask all these same kinds of questions in the link setting as well. Um, but philosophically, what we want to say is that if L0 is, is ribbon concordant to L1, then L0 is somehow simpler or smaller than L1, right? So that's like in that picture that I drew. Um, slides ago, like obviously the trefoil knot is simpler than whatever this disaster of a knot that I've drawn here is, right? But what do I mean by simpler, okay? And so what we would like to say is that from lots and lots of the perspective of lots and lots of different invariants, we would like to say that, um, that L0 is simpler in some sense than L1. Um, and moreover, what that tells me is that if, if they're mutually ribbon concordant, then lots of these invariants um, Will, will fail to distinguish, okay? Because you get, you you know, if we're starting to talk about numerical invariants of any kind, and, and the notion of simpler we have is just like less than or equal to, well then, then it works. Uh, these can't be distinguished. Okay, so let me give a little overview on, of sort of what was known about this topic uh, prior to the past year or so. Um, Okay, so this go, going back to Gordon, if you want to, if you do doing a little bit of elementary four dimensional topology, um, I know that this is in this category of occasion seminar, I imagine many people here maybe are coming from a little bit more of an algebraic bent um, than necessarily a to, uh, topology bent, but you know, I, so um, uh, if you're not familiar. Um, when you have a ribbon concordance, you can think, let's start by talking about what happens with. Uh, some basic topology and the fundamental group. You learn an algebraic topology. Um, uh, the, when you have a ribbon concordance, you can think of, I, you might think about the complement of that surface. So you take S3 cross an interval minus the neighborhood of the surface. Um, and this has a very nice, neat uh, topological description um, in terms of attaching handles. Uh, if you want to read a good play, a good reference for this is in Gomson Stipkinson's book where uh, they talk about. Um, you know, how do you think about the complement? There's a, a section that deals with how do you imagine the complements of embedded surfaces. Um, um, but basically, every time you pass a, uh, you, you, so what you want to do is this. Start with um, S3 minus L0, S3 minus neighborhood of L0, thicken it up by taking uh, a product with an interval. Um, and as every time you pass an index zero critical point of the surface, the complement changes by adding a one handle. And every time you pass an index uh, one critical point of the surface, the complement changes by adding a two handle. And in principle, every time you pass an index three critical point, it would change by adding a three handle, but that's not here. So here what we're seeing is that the complement of the surface is built up out of um, just one handles and two handles. Or if you were to turn it around and look at it backwards, going from L1 to L0, then it would be, you think of it as two handles and three handles. Um, so, okay. Now, one thing that you get out of this immediately, uh, well, not exactly immediately, is that if you look at the fundamental groups of these three spaces, the two link complements and the surface complement in between, um, then the fundamental group of, the, of L, 
of the complement of L0 injects into the fundamental group of the complement, and the fundamental group of S3 minus L1 surjects onto uh, the fundamental group of the conservative complement. Okay, now um, the surjectivity statement is somewhat easy from this description because, um, well, there are no, you're not adding any extra one handle, so if you just, if that's something you could give to your, uh, your algebraic topology students perhaps. Um, the injectivity is harder. It uses some like serious three manifold topology that's due to uh, um, Thurston, senior, um, and um, also some significant group theory uh, that goes back, I think, to the 50s or 60s uh, from Gerson, Haber, and Rauhaus. Um, so that's so the injectivity is like um, you know if you're not thinking of that off the top of your head, um, uh, that's okay. Um, I want to label both of these conditions. Um, this, the latter condition is something that's commonly referred to in the literature as being homotopy ribbon. So if you had a concordance, um, just an arbitrary concordance between knots or between links, um, you could try to describe it not in terms of, uh, you know, forget about like this, you know, uh, Morse function or diagrammatic description, you could just ask, like, what does its algebraic topology look like? Um, and the, this latter condition that we described is known as being homotopy driven. okay? It's, um, uh, you know, the injectivity and surjectivity statements. We call that a homotopy driven concordance. Um, I don't know exactly who coined that terminology. Um, and once we're naming things, we may as well name other things. Uh, so that previous condition about only one and two handles, uh, is going to be somewhat terribly named strongly homotopy ribbon, uh, which is a mouthful, but um, that's a term that some people are already saying. Um, I don't know. I think that term, I don't know exactly uh, who coined that. Maybe it's Ian Zemke and Maggie Miller. And if they're listening, I apologize for calling it a terrible term. It's a great term. Um, uh, okay. Um, all right. So let me, let's now just sort of review some things that are known here. Uh, one of the things that Gordon proved is that that big conjecture about it being an equivalence relation is true in lots of cases, okay? So uh, the condition that he um, said is that if you have two knots that are, um, uh, that are mutually ribbon concordant and the fundamental group of one of them satisfies some condition called being transfinitely nilpotent, which I don't actually wanna to get too far into uh, what that means. Um, it's, it has something to do with the low, it's, it's a statement about the lower central series of this group, um, and not just the, the lower central series, but the transfinite lower central series. Um, uh, in any case, there are a lot of knots that satisfy this condition. Fibered knots, two bridge knots, connected sums of any such knots, cables of any such knots, and then you know, iteratively more connected sums, more cables. Um, uh, um, there are a lot of knots for which this is true. So if you were to you know, go about trying to cook up um, some counterexamples to this conjecture, uh, then you'd want to make sure that you can um, that you don't start with um, a knot that is transfinitely nilpotent. Um, but there are there are families of knots that are not transfinitely nilpotent. Um, uh, the best example being non-trivial knots that have Alexander polynomial one. Um, so there are many. You know. um, so okay. So that but that anyway. That's a condition. Um, that that's that's you know the first bit of evidence for this conjecture, which is in that initial paper where he formulated. Um, here's another another result. Um, uh, remember when I said sort of there's some some degree of simplicity that you can talk about. Um, if one knot is is ribbon home, is ribbon concordant to another, and the other one is fi the second one is fibered, then the first one must be a fibered knot. Okay. Now I put this in the uh, in the pi one section of this talk because fiberedness. If you know, there's a famous theorem of Stallings that says that um, uh, the fundamental group tells you about fiberedness. So a knot is a knot is fibered if and only if the commutator subgroup of its complement is a free group. Um, and so using that condition, so Silver uh, in 1992 reduced this to a certain statement about, uh, about groups and then, um, and then this uh, Kuslukova uh, proved that 14 years later, proved that statement about groups. So that's where we get this um, statement about, uh, about fiberness. Okay, so this is all coming out of it. And I guess homotopy ribbon is good enough here. It doesn't actually have to be a strict ribbon surface. Okay, um, great. So that's the fundamental group. Um, what are some other of our favorite invariants? Uh, polynomial invariants. Uh, the Alexander polynomial, for instance. Um, Gordon observed early on in this story that 
if um, one not if one link is ribbon concordant to another link, uh, like maybe he only stated this for knots, but I'm pretty sure this is true uh, for links as well. Um, uh, then the degree of one link divides the degree. Oh, sorry, the degree of the Alexander polynomial of one is less than or equal to the degree of the Alexander polynomial, polynomial of the other. Um, and a few years later, that was strengthened by Gilmer, um, who showed that in fact these polynomials have to divide each other. Uh, and he did this. Um, so I should say I was um, uh, I was doing a, a project this year where I was supervising some high school a research project for some high school students. Um, from a local science school here, which is one of the most fun things that I've done all year. Um, and I had them learning some knot theory, and in the spring I had them learning some ribbon concordance because, because of course that's what high school students should be learning. Um, and I was able to walk them through Gilmer's proof of this of this theorem here. So that he sort of did this with very sort of explicit geometric um, uh, three-dimensional ideas. Um, in fact, uh, last year Friedel and Powell wrote a paper which really just derived that same property just from this fact. Um, uh, you know, if you, the homotopy ribbon, you know, injecting and surjecting, um, that you are able to, you can deduce the uh, the same uh, the same results just on the fun level of the fundamental group. Um, uh, okay. Uh, question, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so Jen has a question about. Um, he says that he asks if any if there's any meaning attached to the quotient polynomial uh, in the in the theorems that you're citing. Um, that's a good question. Well, so one thing is that this the quotient um, it factors like the Fal Alexander polynomial of a slice knot, um, and you can build it. So basically, what happens it uh, what you do is you start with a ciphered surface for the first link, um, and then using the way the the ribbon bands intersect that ciphered surface, you build up a new ciphered surface. And and so he's really making a statement about about um, about cipher forms, um, and you can read this up. It's it's a very um, I don't know exactly what the topological meaning of this is, but um, but it, it you know you can read it off of a cipher surface essentially. It's the determinant of the cipher surface. Um, does that help? So, thank you. Okay, so now you could ask um, you could start asking the same thing about a, another fav uh, of our favorite um, uh, invariants, um, the Jones polynomial. And I had this question, and I asked Christine Lee this question. Uh, several months ago, uh, and she said, no, it's not true. So I asked, like, is it true um, that if you have a ribbon concordance, then the Jones polynomials have to divide? And um, it turns out that um, that just take your most basic examples, take the trefoil, do a birth, do a merge somehow, and you know, you'll find examples where, uh, where the Jones polynomials don't divide, except this great theorem of Iserman, um, uh, which is from about, you know, 11 years ago, um, which says that if you have an n component ribbon link, that is to say, if you have a ribbon concordance from the n component unlink to your link L, okay, which you could then cap off and think about as sort of n disjoint um, ribbon disks, um, then the Jones polynomial of the unlink divides the Jones polynomial of L. Um, or in other words, it vanishes, the Jones polynomial, polynomial vanishes to a certain order at i or minus i. Minus one, I don't remember. Um, but uh, you know, so the Jones, you get some kind of vanishing um, uh, result of this Jones problem. I'm really interested. Uh, I have not succeeded in, um, but I'm really interested in wondering um, a lot of things about this result, such as whether it has any sort of lift into the world of categorification of homology, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about sort of momentarily. Um, thus far, I don't know. Um, and certainly it doesn't generalize for like an arbitrary link instead of the unlink there. Um, but I, I'm very curious about what else can be said about this. Uh, and I believe this also generalizes to various other, other settings. Um, or, or like uh, classes of links that are bigger than just the um, uh, than ribbon links. So there, there are similar statements for other classes. Okay, great. So now let's come to the second half of the title of the talk. Link homology theories. I know that this is a um, this is a categorification uh, seminar, and I think a lot of people here um, uh, are coming at this from the world of uh, of representation theory and um, uh, and you know quantum groups. Um, I don't know. I actually I, a lot of names I don't recognize on this list. Um, uh, so I'm flipping down. So I, I 
uh, I don't want to leap to any assumptions, but um, uh, but so I will say something about link homologies, link homology theories, the way I, as a really a topologist, think about them, and um, you know you can can uh, tell me tell me how I'm thinking about this in too naive a way. Um, let's imagine. Let's uh, I see a chat here. Um, what if there is a ribbon concordance from an arbitrary split link? Um, I don't think, my guess is, my guess is, I don't know if there's anything to say, uh, but, um, God, so yeah, my guess is, I mean, right, so there's nothing to say in just the, in the unknot setting. Um, so I don't know exactly what, um, uh, what was it? I'm, I'm not sure, um, that's a good question. I, I would love to, um, love to know the answer to this. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you two of my favorite uh, invariants. One of them is not fleur homology, HFK, uh, defined, defined by Oshvath and Salvo and Rasmussen, and the other is Kavanov homology, um, uh, defined by Kavanov. Um, I will say that um, not fleur homology, each of these are link invariants. I've stated a lot of the not fleur homology statements on this page um, for knots um, as opposed to links, but they're actually defined for links, and they're certain just like annoying convention things that you have to pay more attention to. Uh, and in the interest of not saying anything false, I just decided to uh, uh, say things for not. But actually, basically, you can imagine I said link anywhere. Um, um, okay, so what are these, what are these invariants? Uh, in their simplest forms, they're each uh, bigraded vector spaces over your favorite field um, associated to a knot. In uh, the knot floor homology, the gradings are called the um, Alexander and Maslow gradings. Uh, in the Kavanaugh world, they're called the uh, homological and quantum gratings, I and J. Um, and so you can think, and this is the notation that's commonly used for, uh, for, the, two, um, for the two gratings. Um, uh, these are quote unquote categorifications of the Alexander and Jones polynomials. And at first pass, one what, thing that that tells me is that uh, the graded Euler characteristics of these two theories are the Alexander and Jones polynomial. So that is to say, if you take the alternating sum of uh, you know, the homological grading being minus ones and you know, you know, minus one to the, hom to the homological grading and um, you're a formal variable to the quantum grading or the extra grading, um, and then you just measure the dimensions of these groups, you get back these polynomials. Okay, now that's of course not a very sophisticated definition of what does categorify mean and um, you know, as, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, let me just tell you some of the familiar properties of these of these invariants. Um, uh, knot floor homology is really good at detecting topological things about the knot. Uh, for instance, it tells you the genus. Okay, uh, you may remember from elementary knot theory that the Alexander polynomial gives you lower bounds on the genus. Uh, the degree of the knot floor homology tells you the the, um, the genus on the node. So basically, all of the non-zero groups have to be within a certain range. That's completely um, it tells you whether the knot is, whether or not a given knot is fibered, um, uh, which is in one direction of this if and only if uh, the knot is um, uh, is due to Ojbath and Sabo, the easier direction, and then the harder direction was proven by Gigini and Ni, uh, sort of separately, um, uh, subsequently. So basically, like the top uh, the top graded piece of the knot floor homology has degree one dimension one if and only if it's a fiber. Okay, um, the one of homology also tells us some topological things, a little more subtle. Uh, there are lots of other things. Though. I, I haven't stated everything. I, I could go on for an hour just telling important knots, results about Kavanaugh homology and not for homology. Um, uh, but um, Kavanaugh homology tells us uh, about the minimal crossing number of knots, just like the Jones polynomial does in the proof of the Tate conjecture. So if you have been, um, the, somehow the degree spread the spread of the of the of um, the J degrees in which the Kavanaugh homology is non-zero gives you a bound on the um, on the minimal crossing number of the knot, and you have equality in that if and only if this uh, knot is an alternate knot. And this is actually just like um, just like the, the Jones polynomial proof of, of the Tate conjecture. Um, okay, so that's um, uh, that's um, you know just some basic properties of these that I want to mention. Um, but now I want to mention um, uh, the functoriality of these things. Um, why are these really categorifications in some sense? Okay, so uh, you know it would be nice to be able to relate 
um, when you have a, a surface interpolating between two knots, um, you'd love to be able to relate the surfaces, the, the invariance of one uh, of these things to the invariance of the other one. Um, but of course, um, with polynomials, there's no like map from one polynomial to another. But with groups, there are maps. Okay, so this is what was done. So let me start with the Kavanaugh setting, um, which is actually the side that I'm going to focus on here. Um, uh, if you have a link, co any link cohortism, so previously I've just been talking about concordances, which are annulus, annuli, but you could also talk about higher genus surfaces. You can talk about things that are disconnected. They could have closed components. Um, uh, but if you have any link cohortism from one link to another, you get an induced map from one, from, from, from a induced linear map from the Kavanaugh homology of one to the Kavanaugh homology of the other. Um, and this is homogeneous with respect to the bigrading. Um, I should say that this has to be an oriented surface. Um, it's a homogeneous map with respect to the bigrading of the, uh, um, and, and how it shifts the two gratings is determined by the genus of the surface. And in particular for a concordance, it's a bigrading preserving map. It's actually, you know, it takes the, piece, the ij piece of L0 to the ij piece of L1. Um, and, um, uh, right, so it, it's um, homogeneous, okay. It's an invariant of, of the surface up to isotopy fixing the boundary. Um, and it's functorial under stacking. So if you take two cohortisms and you compose them, then the induced map fixing. And I guess in the past two talks, we heard a lot from uh, Gregor and Ness about some of how this is done in a different version of this story, uh, this odd Kavanaugh homology. Uh, um, uh, and I should just mention a couple of names here. Kavanaugh, Jacobson, and Barnaton initially proved the invariance sort of only up to a sign. Um, and then uh, Caprao and Clark Morrison and Walker sort of uh, introduced some decorations that eliminate the sign ambiguity. Um, and actually very recently, um, a result that I'd like to know a lot more about, in fact, um, uh, if any of the authors happen to be hanging out, I would love to chat with you. Um, uh, the results of Morrison, Walker, and Redrick um, saying that um, you actually get an isotope not only under isotopies in R3 cross I, but R3 cross an interval, but actually in S3 cross interval. Um, and if you want to think about why that's an issue, uh, I will invite you to do so in your own time. Um, uh, and then I should say that Juhas and Zemke each uh, defined similar structure in the world of knot-floor homology. Um, and th and that what's, what's very different in the world of knot-floor homology as opposed to Kavanaugh is that um, knot-floor homology makes sense, it, just by definition, not only for knots and links in the three sphere, but for knots and links in an arbitrary three manifold. Um, and the cohortism maps, as they were finally defined, um, it took sort of a long time to get the definition of the cohortism map right. Uh, um, um, but uh, those make sense not only for cohortisms just in the product, in like Y cross I, but in any, any smooth four-dimensional manifold interpolating between the two, two three manifolds, if you have a surface in there, you get such a thing. Okay, so the, that construction is sort of much more flexible in many ways. Um, I'm not going to get into the details. I'm going to, I'm focusing here on the Kavanaugh uh, uh, piece of the story, which is um, where my contributions uh, 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 lie here. Um, but, but okay, so you, you have this notion of functoriality. Okay, and now this will bring us to finally a theorem, um, a big theorem that's going to be a lot of people attached to it. Um, so what I want to say is if, if, if you have a ribbon concordance, let's just bracket that parenthesis there for a moment. You have a ribbon concordance from one link to another link. Um, then what Ian Zemke showed how to prove for not far homology is that the induced map of, um, of one of the, of the invariant of the not far homology of L0 to the not far homology of L1 is injective. Okay. And in fact, it's better. So many of these invariants, I've stated them for as vector spaces, but you could actually define them not only as vector spaces, but as Z modules, which might be torsion, or maybe they even have more fancy algebraic structure. Um, and whatever, whatever fancy algebraic structure, whatever category you're talking about is, it's not just an injection, it's an injection as a direct sum map, the left invertible map. Um, uh, and we're going to see exactly where the left inverse comes from. Um, and Ian Zemke um, proved this for not floor homology um, around maybe February of last year. Um, uh, and then the floodgates open. Okay, so what, are the, what else um, uh, happened? Um, Ian and Maggie Miller, uh, a few months later, uh, proved that the same thing holds under slightly weaker hypotheses 
Um, it doesn't actually just have to be a ribbon uh, a ribbon cobordinum. It could a ribbon concordance. It could be a strongly homotopy ribbon co co uh, Oh, by the way, I don't think I even mentioned this before. Um, it is totally unknown whether um, a strongly homotopy ribbon implies ribbons. Um, it certainly might be the case. Like we don't have any. Um, it, it's. I realize this is sort of um, um, you know forced concept, but but. Um, it, these do, these two things might be might be um, equivalent to each other. I don't we don't. Um, but ribbon, of course, is the sort of the, the, the strongest. Okay. So right. So anyway. So um, Miller and Zemke proved that you get these injections from alpha homology. Um, Zemke and I uh, proved um, within a couple of weeks of his paper appearing um, that you get an injection on Kavana homology, um, uh, and um, then in work that is to appear, my student Ankar Gudral and I have been working on um, extending that result to strongly homotopy ribbon. I'm going to say more about that um, you know, at the very end of the talk. Um, um, but there are a lot of other invariants out there, a lot of other sort of homological type invariants of, of knots. And I'm just going to mention a few of them. Basically, uh, the philosophy seems to be that any, any uh, homological knot invariant you could think of um, is going to be uh, is going to have this property under ribbon concordance. Okay, so let me mention a few. Um, one is a paper by uh, Lidman, Velovic, and Wang. Um, one of those papers that reminds you about the difference between a hyphen and an n dash. Um, uh, um, they proved a number of results. Um, one is for the, what's called instanton knot homology. Um, another is for uh, so um, one way of good at getting good knot invariants is take your knot. Take the branch double cover of the knot, which is some three manifold, um, and then take various versions of fleur homology associated with that three manifold. Um, and you could take the, fleur, the Hager fleur homology of that three manifold. You could take the instant on fleur homology of that three manifold. Um, and um, uh, you know, and those were also sort of quarter, you know, PQFT type uh, theories. And so you get you know sort of homological um, knot invariants. And again, you get the same notion of injectivity um, uh, for under. Uh, ribbon differences. Um, and strong, strong homotopy ribbon, I think, is just sort of built into the story there. Um, another set of invariants is SLN homologies um, due to Kovanov and Rizansky. Um, and there are two papers, one by Kang and one by uh, Kaprao, Gonzalez, Lee, Lawrence, Sozanovich, and Zhang, um, uh, um, basically giving different proofs of this, uh, of, um, this injectivity, the same kind of injectivity results uh, for SLN homology. Um, and I bet I'm missing others, and you know, you can add your favorite invariants to this list. Um, uh, if, you know, if it's if you have maps associated to um, uh, to, to, to surface surface cobordisms, um, you could bet almost bet that this is going to work. Um, okay, are there any questions? I want to just just uh, pause a second for um, before I get into any of um, uh, of this. People can speak if they unmute and ask questions. Can I mention something? Sure, please do. Okay, hello, this is Carmen Capro. Just to mention that in the paper that you have there as a last bullet point, actually we are doing it for the universal uh, SL2 homology, universal SL3 uh, uh -huh. homology, and the foam SLN homology. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Not universal, of course. Yeah. Got it. Not kovanov rosansky homology. Yes. Ah, okay. I thought to mention that. <laughs> My mix up. Thank Sorry, you for I, uh... mentioning our paper. No, no that's okay. Thank, thank you for the correction. I appreciate it. Thank that. you. Thank you. Um, um, okay. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's see some things. So first thing I want to say is that, I mean, this is very interesting if you're interested in link homology theories, um, which I am. Uh, and many people here uh, really th probably think in terms of categorification. But I just want to point out a couple of ways in which you can um, take these results and then extract some interesting topology out of them. Uh, you know, it's always great when you can make a statement that doesn't involve the invariance that you were talking about and was just about but somehow about the topology. Um, so one corollary that Ian Zemke uh, observed is that if um, uh, one link is driven concordant to another, um, maybe he stated this in terms of knots, but you can say this for links too. 
um, then the cipher genus of one is less than or equal to the cipher genus of the other. Okay, now why is that? Um, well, remember what we said. We said that the, the um, cipher genus is completely determined by the knot floor homology. And it's completely determined by sort of where the knot floor homology is non-zero, right? There's some range of, some of these groups are non-zero and, and the like, the range of gradings in which the groups are non-zero um, tells you what the genus is, okay? Now, if um, the, the knot floor homology of L0 injects into the knot floor homology of L1, then that tells you that the knot floor homology of L1 is bigger than the knot floor homology of L0. So that is to say, there are more potentially more non-zero groups. Okay, and if there are potentially more non-zero groups, then um, uh, then that's good, right? Because it means that um, it, it means that it gives you a, perhaps a, a a stronger lower bound on the genus. Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay, I'll state another one. Um, if two knots are ribbon concordant uh, in this fashion. Um, and one of them is alternating, uh, not alternating a non-split, then you get a lower bound of crossing numbers. Because as I said before, crossing number, again, is something that at least has bounds on it coming from uh, sort of how much of the Kavanaugh homology is non-zero or where the non-zero sum ends of the, of the Kavanaugh homology are lying in what gradings. Um, and that inequality is sharp, right? That, that can, that is sharp for, L, for the alternating one. So if you just, you know, trace a couple of inequalities here, um, you'll deduce that the, uh, that the Kabbalah homology, that you get this cross Um Okay, and these as a, also apply in the strongly homotopy ruin set. Um, here's something interesting that um, my student Ankar pointed out to me a couple weeks ago, um, and I listed it as a question mark here because I don't know if this was known before, um, which is that if you have a, a so, we want to talk about here, what's one measure of complexity for a link? Well, being unlinked is a very much non-complex behavior, okay? And one thing that you can deduce from these results, and I really don't know if this was known before, I would like to, if anyone um, happens to know, I would love to, uh, I, I would love to hear from you, um, is that if you have a ribbon concordance from one link to another, and the second one is a split link, so let's say that the components can be separated by a sphere, um, then the corresponding, um, uh, components of L0 can also be separated by a sphere. I, I gave a multiple um, And this uses the fact that many of these invariants, the von homology, but also the, Hagar, the, the Fleur homology type invariants, um, somehow affect splitness. And you, can, um, and you can use this in conjunction with the various injectivity results. Um, okay. Um, looks like I have about seven minutes to go. So let me, um, let me, dive in a little bit to the proof. And I'm gonna talk about how this proof works um, in the Kavanaugh homology setting. Um, and, um, and then we can talk about how this can be, how this can be modified. Um, um, so the maps, that, uh, I, I believe pictures like this may have appeared in um, Gregoire's talk um, uh, in the past two weeks, I think. Um, um, uh, this, the maps on Kavanaugh homology satisfy some local relations. And uh, one is, and was, what are they? So first of all, I should have said that, um, I don't know, maybe I did say, uh, that Kavanaugh homology not only associates maps to um, surfaces, surface cobordisms, but also to dotted surfaces. So that is to say, a surface with some number of chosen points, okay, on each, on the surface, and the points are allowed to move about freely. Um, now, there are some local relations that they satisfy. Um, and I want to try to parse these. Uh, so one of them, the one in the upper right, is telling me that if I have a, uh, a cobordism and I have a surface with two dots on it, then the map must be zero. Um, the second one, uh, I want to start, let me do the bottom one first and, and give a, a careful statement at this point. Um, if you have a tube uh, in your surface, and the way you should think about this tube is it's a, um, uh, it's an embedded three-dimensional one handle uh, in, the, in four dimensions. Okay, so it's like a it's like an embedded arc thickened up um, uh, with the ends on the surface and otherwise this drawing from the surface. Okay, and if you um, think about what happens by surgering that surface, so that is to say, um, you know, you uh, basically drill out two discs from the surface and then and then attach a tube, um, then um, the result is the same as the sum of two maps. One is the map where you had just left the surface unchanged but added a dot on one end, and the other is the same if you had to touch the dot on the other end. Um, okay, that's one thing that you can deduce. 
Um, uh, the second uh, local relation is that spheres can basically be eliminated. So if you have a, an unknotted, unlinked, if you have a, 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 a cohort is a map, and then somewhere like far away from it, you have a, an undotted, uh, unknotted two sphere, um, S, which is unlinked from this, right? So it's just like a own independent thing. Um, and then what I'm, when the, what this is going to tell me is that the Kavanaugh homology of, uh, or the induced map associated to the surface union, the two sphere is zero. Two, you know, that two sphere kills the map. Um, and if, but if you did a dotted two sphere, then it doesn't change the map. So that is say the Kavanaugh homology of um, this surface union uh, or the map of the uh, surface union a dotted sphere is unchanged. Um, as a result of some earlier early results in this area from Rasmussen and Tanaka, um, the spheres are allowed to be, to be knotted in, in four space, but they still, at least the way this is a priori stated, um, they have to be unlinked. We will come back to this. Um, you know, I'm starting to run all on time. Um, okay, so now let me tell you the, the, um, uh, the amazing piece of, um, of uh, why all of this works so well for ribbon concordances. If you take a ribbon concordance, let's imagine we have this ribbon concordance, and you can imagine the reverse concordance, which is like an anti-ribbon concordance, I guess. Dude is going from L1 to L0, and you glue them together um, along the copy of S3 that contains L1. Okay, and um, so that's what you're going to think of as a concordance from L0 to itself. Um, and then you should also think about the identity cohortism from L0 to itself. Okay, and um, Okay, now those are not the same. Those are not how many, they're not isotopic. They're not, you know, um, they're, they're different cohortisms. But the claim is going to be that those two things both induce the same map. Okay, now of course the identity cohortism induces the identity map. Okay, now once you know that, then what you're going to be able to say is that that's giving you your left inverse to the map associated to C. Okay, so the map associated to C bar is giving me the inverse because, because I'm, I want to say that, that D, this doubled cohortism, is going to give me the same map. Okay, and what Ian Zemke showed is he gave you a little, gives a little lemma um, that tells me exactly how D is built. So basically, D is built up. You start with the, the identity product cohortism here. I wish I had drawn a picture here. I didn't get a chance to draw a picture. Um, um, you have some, un some unlinked two spheres um, that are far away from it, okay? And then you have some one handles that are connecting the, this, I, this product cohortism to the two spheres. And when you do that surgery, now, now maybe they're very, the, maybe the one handles are very complicatedly tied up with the product cohortism and the two sphere. That's where the complication may lie here. It's very hard to draw any of this. Um, um, but given that lemma, all of this, uh, you know, all of these, these proofs that I mentioned turn on some version of using that topological description. So what happens here, okay? What this tells me is that the Kavanaugh homology map of D, as I said, let me walk through the proof here, is the sum using, uh, using the neck cutting relation, you know, at every, on each one of those necks. Um, it's the sum of ways to put a dot either on the two sphere or on the eye, okay? Now, um, any one of the terms in which, you have a, in which you don't have a dot on the two sphere must be zero, okay? Um, and those just give you ones. Um, and so then that tells you that you're getting the identity here and that's what's, that's, uh, that's the proof, okay? Um, uh, correct my statement about, uh, about this foam, foam SLN homology and universal SL2 and SL3 homology. Um, that's all right. Um, um, uh, but you can do the same, the same idea except that the local relations are more complicated. In not floor homology, it's not exactly the same kind of neck cutting, but it's still some sort of operation of what happens when you sort of tube on a sphere. In this okay, so I'm almost done. Um, um, what I just want to mention this sort of strongly homotopy ribbon business. Um, so in the not floor homology setting, the, the fact that those spheres were knotted or were unknotted and were unlinked doesn't really affect the argument at all. It, it, the same it, the argument sort of goes through exactly. You don't have to assume that in any way. And what Miller and Zemke observed is that in this weaker setting of strongly homotopy ribbon, um, you get the same, essentially the same kind of topological description of D, of the doubled cohortism, but you just have one catch. The catch is that the spheres are no longer necessarily assumed to be 
unlink from the product uh, from the product surface here. They might be linked up in some complicated way. Um, I think they're still unknotted, individually unknotted in in SSL side, but um, but that's okay. In their world, that's completely fine. Um, what Ankar and I have been doing in this paper that will appear soon is essentially showing that that's okay. Um, and that you can use those same sphere relations uh, for cobordism maps, um, even when the two spheres are linked to the rest of the cobordism. Um, and I'll, I'll just sort of state our, our main theorem. The theorem has something to do with when you have a cobordism, one thing you do is you is basically, um, the maps are unchanged under like pulling certain parts, pieces apart. And the, I guess the, the, the careful way of stating this is whenever you have a cobordism between split links, um, the map on Kavanaugh homology is the same as the map induced by the, the, the cobordism where I've separated out each of the components into a sort of a split cobordism. Um, so I'm over time, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just stop there. Thanks for listening. All right, thanks so much, Adam. Um, are there any questions? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay, can I ask a question? Yes, so th thanks for a great talk, Sai. Thank you. If I just take the unknot with trigger diagram, split it into two unknots, is that a ribbon concordance? Uh, it's not a concordance because it's not an annulus, right? That's a, um, you know, that's a pair of pants. So it has to be an annulus. Yeah, right. An annulus. So in particular, it has to have the same number of components at the beginning and the end. Yeah, so yeah. if you then capped off one of those disks, if you capped off one of those two unknots, that would be a concordance, but not a ribbon concordance because it's just, uh, you know, you have a depth there. I see, I see, I see, yeah. Okay. And then what happens when you do a covariant SL2 homology? Because there are zero with dot is not zero, it's... Uh... Oh, sorry, it just assumed out the dots. I mean, it, well, let me think. No, no, it's, I guess it's still, yeah, let me just, let me just think myself and I'll stop this question. I bet you know better than I do. Adam, is yes. there a reason the plus, the sign, plus minus sign in the last theorem? Yes, yes, yes. So basically, we have been doing all of this in the setting of using Barnathan's sort of, um, uh, you know, tangles and tangles and cobordism story, and we were not brave enough to to think about what happens with orientations with, with like disorientations and and getting the signs right. Um, uh, maybe we could actually do that if we were working if, if we were a little more careful. So we, we we've just been sort of using sort of basically replicating what Gerard did in his. Uh, in his paper, um, and um, um, but I have I suspect oh so I should say the way that how does all of this work? Um, uh, Bats and C to have this sort of perturbation of of Kavanaugh homology um, uh, where you sort of induce introduce some terms that go backwards in the differential, um, uh, and it's very useful for sort of understanding link splitting. Um, we basically just sort of set up cobordism maps on that theory. Um, and we weren't sure how to deal with all of the sort of disorientation or, um, you know, sort of its own description of, of the thing surfaces. Um, that may be due to laziness on our part. So really, you know, there shouldn't be a plus or minus sign there, I think. Yeah, thank you for your answer. And I have a quick question for uh, uh, Mikhail. When you are referring to the uh, equivariant SL2 homology, is that the same as the universal SL2 homology? And can you clarify if I have a big misunderstanding here? Oh, oh so I mean, I'm pretty flexible. So you can mean, I mean, you can, I usually, when I say equivariant, I usually mean U2 equivariant. So it means that the homology of the empty link is just symmetric polynomials into variables. And homology of the unknot diagram, or the unknot is, well, you can think of it as just is kind of given, given by adding additional generator x with relation x square minus some e1 x plus e2 equals zero. So usually by covariant, I usually mean usually equivalent, but one can clarify. So I think one should 
course, usually it's verify what it means by a covariant SL2. But I actually have another question. So if, um, if instead of a link concordance, you start with a trivalent graph concordance, so take a trivalent graph, maybe need a little bit of data around the vertices or some kind of framing, and look at the graph, well, concordance of graphs, um, whether you would get something, you have to define it carefully, but whether you'd get a similar injection for a SL3 homology. So SL3 homology is being extended to abortisms of graphs by Clark. Mm -hmm. um, one would have to check, I, I guess it should probably work for in the Aquarian case as well. And I don't remember what he did with science, but I think you can, you can just, uh, it makes sense to check how much of this would work for concordance of graphs, which are trivalent, etc. in the SL3 case. And in the SL1 case, you can look at kind of SLM MOI graphs embedded in R3 and their cobordisms. But I don't know if anyone has worked out the corresponding functionality for those, for those cobordisms. But SL3 case, I think, is, makes sense by starting with Clark's paper, Clark's mm -hmm. thesis. Clark's thesis and just seeing where we get an injection on the level of homology, both usual and equivalent. Interesting. Interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure there are people here who know this stuff that much far better than I do, so I will. Again, I, I think, I, I mean, this is really spectacular. So I'd like to understand the original arguments, but maybe this would work for graph concordance as well. Mm -hmm. Ah, I'm seeing a question in the chat here. Um, uh, Benjamin Cooper says there's an objectivity statement for ribbon concordance in Belton Wilson's 2012 PhD thesis. Um, uh, I was not aware of this uh, um, result, but I, um, uh, yeah, um, um, uh, I would love to see that. I, uh, oh. Um. See. Okay, I'll look at I'll, I'll look at this one. I'm not uh, sitting here, but um, that's very interesting. Um, I, will, I will I will look that up. I, I'm wondering, um, does the Lipschitz Sarkar homotopy refinement give any further information here? Um, that's a great question. Um, um. I don't know. I don't know what could be said about that. that I think, I mean, I think that's a totally natural question to ask. Um, whether there's some way, to, I mean, so what are the map when you have, when you have, um, you know, cobordisms between, between links, you know, what do you get on the lipschitz sharkar um, uh, you know, um, homotopy refinement? You get maps of, of spaces or? That's right. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe there would be some way of, saying something about that map. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'd be really interested to know what that is. Thank you. Thank you, it was a great talk, so. Thank you. All right, I'm going to pause, I mean, stop the recording, but feel free to stay and I'm just going to hand control over to Adam. So uh, thank you again for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me. It was really fun. And whenever you feel like you need to go take a break, um, you can just end the session. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much.